Hello everyone, I am Santi. And I am Mao. And this is the Game Design Perspective. Uh, we're both game designers in the game industry and we are going to talk about it. <laughs> Before everything, disclaimer, this is our opinion, our opinion alone. This does not represent any employer that we work currently or previously or any other studio that we talked about this in this podcast. Yeah. This is just our opinion based on our years of experience in the game industry. That said, today's subject is there are no bad games, just overscoped ones. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. So, a lot of games, um, a lot of people might not recognize where overscoping comes from or how, uh, I don't know how to say, but like, I don't hear it often in reviews or analysis that like people say like people like they would say like oh the developers were overworked or like the working conditions were not great and uh, or the game is not finished or anything oh, in between. Do you know that another one like we know that that usually uh, teams need uh, more time to finish a yeah. game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's also a product of overscoping. And people don't actually know about it. It's just like, yeah. oh, give them more time. But it's also a product of this. Yeah, so that's the difference, right? Like, um, it, the, the thing is that oh, the scoping of the game happens at the beginning. And then they, but people mention the end part that is like, oh, they needed more time to finish the game. But they don't talk that at the beginning, the planning, like, has everything to do with that sentiment yeah so for that i would like to tell a little story uh when i was studying game design in vancouver film school my team and i like like the team i was part of because it wasn't my team like the team i was part of uh we kind of talked about making a melee combat focused game like a hack and slash kind of a, a big reference was uh devil may cry and uh, ninja gaiden but a uh, all our teachers just kept telling us like it's it's too big. They, they, they're making melee combat for like students, and in the time frame is like a, an insane task, you know. And uh, and it, it it became this microcosm of uh, bigger teams and overscoping, dealing with like deadlines, and uh, it was such a learning experience because I learned how, what overscoping does to a project very early on and it made me hyper aware of like overscoping because we were like sleeping at school we definitely didn't finish we're working we we were working in the game like on the game still the delivery day like an hour before the delivery we were still working in like in the game and we're building like the game because we just didn't have time full of bugs and It was not a smooth process. We had to struggle a lot. And it became a big micro, like it became such a microcosm of what happens in the game industry uh, nowadays for similar reasons. Like the reasons were the same. The overscoping, the lack of understanding of like the team's strengths. There's so many problems there so yeah. many problems that we didn't understand back then but i was able to learn as a student there and then being in the game industry became this microcosm of like whoa what i experienced there i'm still experiencing today <laughs> yeah it, it it's just so real you know like i remember when i was a student right and i was working on my capstone project i instead of doing something melee related i did a stealth game and mm -hmm. I was so scared of overscoping. Yeah. Right? Because I had already done some some projects by myself or one of them was uh with a team, but that was like uh very small, right? Yeah. I was so afraid of that that I was like, okay, um let's cut stealth to its very basics, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember like a lot of people in the team wanted to overscope it, wanted to overhype it. Dude, let's it, it's a it's a stealth game uh in the world of toys, right? Uh, similar to a Toy Story mission, right? It, but they wanted a, a dragon boss fight. I was like, <laughs> guys, you realize we have like, I don't know, three months or four? Like, yeah, it's yeah, going to yeah. be impossible. Like, we we have to 
make all of the game work the dragon boss fight is not gonna make it but they yeah. still want it so i was like okay let's focus on what matters on the core and let's talk about the dragon boss fight after after we're done with that we barely made it to where we wanted with the core of the game and yeah. it's not polished you know like <laughs> it's not no. where everyone wants it to be no your student project was more impressive than mine <laughs> i remember i even um i was play like uh we invite people from the industry to play test our games and yes. there was uh there was a producer of sleeping dogs back then because sleeping oh. dogs was made in vancouver united front games right so the producer was there he was invited and he's playing our game he just looks at me and says like melee combat right <laughs> he just looks at me like melee combat yeah. right? <laughs> just looking at this dude, and i'm just looking at this dude like almost crying you know <laughs> like oh my god really combat! oh my god really combat! Yeah. yeah dude and i was like and he was like yeah man like we struggle a lot in sleeping dogs just doing the melee combat it was like such a big part of the team just working on that feature and yes. uh and i was like oh my god like i i i i I think that's partially why I'm obsessed with like combat in general is because I I made that mistake like we made that mistake. Right. Uh but like honestly uh, like as a learning experience I wouldn't change it. So no, of course not. there's a lot a lot to learn in failing and a lot of times the studios see that, you know? Like yeah. Failure is also a huge part in, in applying to a job. And I've had interviews where it's like, okay, how did yeah. you deal with this issue? And sometimes it's like, well, we're not able to make it, but now I would deal it with it this way. And still you see that. So it's important to, to, to fail like that. Yeah. I, I like to be honest, the reality is that as a student, as a game development student, you're allowed to fail. Do it. But in a professional environment, over scoping no. and failing in that kind of way, the game industry very rarely forgives. Yeah. Very rarely. Yep. United Front Games doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Like that to put it on perspective. So the reality is that this subject over like the scoping of your project is so important but at the same time so not talked about yeah. it just blows my mind i just don't understand how this happens right and i think the first point i want to make is that the number one reason i see well not the number one but one of the main reasons why a lot of studios and a lot of uh, a lot of projects including student projects overscope is because they are da -da, trying to match a market so what 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 does that mean for the longest time the whole game industry a lot of the game industry sorry is based on following a trend a uh, you can start from like the 90s when mario and sonic comes out Everything was mascots trying to take that market. The thing is that back then, because of technology, overscoping a project was a lot harder. Teams were smaller, budgets were smaller, games were less risky. You know, therefore, why in the 90s you can have games like, I don't know, Pepsi Man, you know? Yeah. But you get games like Bob C and you games, you get like it was all the rage to get like a, a, mascot. a mascot a mascot right it was like all the rage you know you get rayman and you get like a bunch of gex you know a, and that trend kind of slows down in the 2000s right but what happens if you see the the history of this is like the continue of matching of the market still exists right the playstation comes out final fantasy 7 comes out and and then all of a sudden it becomes a success and everybody wants to make a turn-based RPG. Everybody. Yeah. No. And the the market becomes flooded with a bunch of RPGs, you know, of a lot of studios that don't exist today. So 
again, here we go, right? Like a, a, another one, you know, like another trend. And then in 2000s becomes Grand Theft Auto because Grand Theft Auto 3 comes out and it takes the world by storm, yeah. you know? And now everything has to be like a Grand Theft Auto clone, you know? And you get like franchises like Mafia and True Crime that are like trying to get this, like this vibe of Grand Theft Auto it still happens today. Dude, not only that, because at least those games were, well, those games were trying to be Grand Theft Auto, right? But dude, like one of my favorite games ever, Jack 2, was mm -hmm. an open world because they saw Grand Theft Auto. And it's like, where, yep. when we, where can we take Jack and Daxer that is uh, a little bit similar to, to Grand, Grand Theft Auto, right? Which was all the rage. And they did it amazing, but they were still yep. following a trend. And that's that's pretty much what you're saying. They weren't following a trend. I'll tell you why. Because they try, like, what they did is they they grab what like they grab what the structure of Grand Theft Auto and they applied it to Jack and Daxter. But Jack and Daxter is obviously not trying to be Grand Theft Auto. It's not trying to be this crime city drama. You know. Yeah. But the market was flooded with crime city dramas. With yeah, Grand Theft sure. Auto, and it still happens. So still, this is a thing that happens from time to time, right? And then comes the open world craze or the game as service craze. Right now, I can tell you, I cannot say specifics because I'm under NDA, but I can tell you right now, there's uh, so many studios, so many studios with game as service on their wraps that they haven't been announced. So all the game of service that you see now announced, there is so many more incoming. You know? But yeah. they're trying to match a market. But you're not trying to match a market with the same budget or team. So let's say you want to make a Destiny, you know? You want to make Destiny. You want to make uh, Overwatch. You want to make all, like these game of service games, for example, which is now the craze. You want to make Fortnite. Well, a lot of teams don't have the capacity and the staff and the budget to do it, but the market says that that game is successful. So they're matching as much as they can to that market, and that tends to overscope. Because the moment you make any kind of game a game of service, the scope triples. Because you're, you need multiplayer components, because you need support you need to design all the support you need all the microtransactions you need like a lot of a lot of people don't talk about this as well but one of the biggest in like increases in scope is in the back end if you grab a game that is like if you grab any studio and you say you're making a game of service well where are the serve where like game of service well where are the servers why where is the technology behind all yeah. the net code, you know, like big companies can do it. But if you grab a medium sized company, how are you tackling all these back end that is just to make the game work? And then you see a yeah. lot of games not working. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, yes, you can have all the systems working, but. Then again, you you kind of need to make all of those systems be smaller and smaller and smaller so that transfer data can be quicker, yeah. right? And if it's not quick enough, then you've got what everyone loves lag, and it just it just doesn't doesn't work for people. So the thing is that engines yeah. nowadays have um, lag simulation. Unreal has lag simulation. So you can set up ping and you can set up like microseconds of lag and you can play test with lag. Not just that, while you're doing a live like a live service game or an, any online game, you can play test by making servers with your own computers, right? So you don't need to play, you usually don't want the full backend ready to play test your game, your online game. That's the reality, yeah. right? But then, how do you launch? You cannot easily launch without a backend, no. No. right? Like, and and then that, that costs. And then so you have the game finished. It can happen. I've seen it happen. You have like a relatively finished game, but then 
you cannot launch it because you don't have any of the backend. So you have like that bottleneck there. So what could have been a nice single player or co-op focused game or like a simple, a more simple online component. Now you need this whole backend behind just because it's now a game of service because you're chasing the market. You're trying to match what the market is telling you to do. And in reality, usually if you research the game, like the game industry, back trying to follow those trends, you end up with an overscope project and you end up with like a thousand problems that you cannot solve. And yeah. many times, like in the case of United Front Games, which was an impeccable studio, I loved it. You end up going down. You know, uh, right. it happened also to Radical Entertainment, you know, trying to chase the Grand Theft Auto craze. They make this open world in a city which, with powers and everything. And Radical Entertainment was in Vancouver. They closed down while I was starting in Vancouver. I saw it close down. And it was yeah. so sad because it was like, like this is the, the, the studio that made Simpsons Hit and Run. Yeah. You know, it's like a classic. A, Dude, that's a, a classic. Cl a classic, right? Like a yeah. legendary studio that there was other yeah. problems. But one of their biggest problems was chasing this trend, trying to get funding. And then, you know, not only that, like uh, chasing a trend sometimes, uh, sometimes you don't have the team that specialize on that. I think that's what kind of happened to Redfall. It was Redfall, right? I think yeah. I think it kind of happened to them, right? They were not used to making that kind of games. You know, the studio was just not, they were not specialized on that. And then that's what, what happens. Well, Redfall has several problems that we're going to discuss now as well you know they were trying to match the market with a game of service microsoft i think microsoft wanted this is all allegedly where i'm not confirming because i don't work like none of us worked on arcane ever so we were not there but this is an edu educated opinion let's call it that right but like the educated opinion is that first that there is some like there has some info has surfaced that microsoft wanted something in that calendar slot uh and then yeah they were trying to match the market as a game of service so multi like they were mul pushing multiplayer first which is I, I have stories about that with like far cry uh and uh so again this is all allegedly but the reality is that they wanted they wanted a game of service they wanted to like push the multiplayer they wanted to push the seasonal content they wanted to push this with redfall and uh it didn't work out one of them matching the market but this actually ties to my next point why a lot of studios overscoped so the right tool for the right task ah <laughs> so redfall was pretty much uh on point <laughs> yeah redfall was on point because it's not just a game of service it was they yeah. transferred the, the development to unreal which is like a development tool that they didn't use before Prey, which was like a like the like was their previous project in Arcane Austin, was made in a different engine. If you just follow the the trail, you know. So yeah. this is, I think, this is the first project of Arcane that is made in Unreal. So right, the right tool for the right task. I can tell you from experience that Unreal has difficulty, you know, with network play. It is difficult to do. It's a lot of replication. The the network the network packages are quite big. It's very difficult to deal with like ping. You know, it's a real struggle. It's a real thing. We yeah. we suffered a lot, and because Unreal Unreal is not made. You know, one of the reasons, and this is this comes from Call of Duty developers specifically, like they're like in an interview lead like. Uh, game designer i was asking about their engine right so call of duty engine is like the call of duty is made in the call of duty engine right and one of the things is that they scope their games perfectly they have all the money in the world but if you notice they scope their games perfectly because they have a kind of old engine 
but the engine is very studied is very understood and has very specific tasks that they are like really good at you know and call of duty has incredible weapon feel because that's something that the engine is made for you know and yeah. it's made for set pieces and it's made for graphical fidelity it's not made for open world so you see the call of duty engine for example the modern warfare reboot or any call of duty they look incredible they have great set pieces the weapon feel is excellent and they can keep doing this and an online play you know it's focused on these specific features the engine so they use they won't change to like unreal engine because their proprietary tools are great for the task if you grab that engine and you want to do something else with it then you start to have problems then you have to have struggles right which is like what a lot allegedly this is like again what we've seen people talk about we educated i didn't opinion. work at bioware yeah educated opinion is what you see with like engines that are like like for example in the case of mass effect andromeda or you see bioware struggling with tools uh, you start to see this so when you're coming up with a game the more you can match your technology the smoother your planning and execution is going to be right right it's just yeah. a, i have a story here that well, uh, ubisoft was pushing for a lot of game as service at some point and far cry 6 was supposed to be one of them it was pushing really hard for game as service it was pushing for like multiplayer. It was pushing for like uh, weapon level. It was pushing for a similar experience and destiny. But their en the engine that they were using back then, uh, Dunia, was not the ideal engine for the for the purpose. So at some point, the team had to backpedal. The team had to, and it was a really conscious and really smart decision that they detected this. And they detect this and it's like, you know what? Let's just make a solid Far Cry. Let's make a solid Far Cry. Yeah. You know? Let's 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 make a like a solid Far Cry. And and when it the game came out in the market, people saw it as like, oh, just another Far Cry. You know, it's just another yeah. Far Cry. It's just another Far Cry. It look it feels like Far Cry. They need to change their formula, you know. There's a bunch of things there. But the reality is that. Well, it, it, working on this game, you know, we set up to the task with like a year and a half before like release date to just make a good, solid Far Cry that people could enjoy. Yeah. That's it. And this is why like Far Cry 6 might feel similar to a lot of people, but this is because like, the, the tools were not there for the right task, you know? Yeah, you were kind of already working on, on another Far Cry, you were, you, and you need a project to keep the studio moving, so... Yeah. You can just yeah. stop. You can just discard everything you have, right? And just move on. Like, it, it's so hard to do that, right? Even, yeah. Even if a lot of, of the game was there from pre previous Far Cry games, like, the amount of content that is... Uh, that it has to be added from a previous Far Cry. That's like, that's what make it makes it new, right? Because it's not easy, right? Like, no, not because uh, a game has the same character controller as the previous game makes the next one being just a DLC, right? Like, yeah, it doesn't necessarily need to be like that. Yeah, it's just again the right tool for the right task, right? Dunia. Exactly. The engine of Far Cry comes from the Crytek engine. It's like a bit, like they, they, wow. they're practically cousins. You can see, yes. <laughs> right, right, because Far Cry comes from Cry Crytek and the Cry engine. Yeah. You know, like and, and then Dunia uh, is like adapted from the technology to keep working on Far Cry, right? So yeah. it's based, it's based on the Cry engine, and and what what was the Cry engine created to do? Crisis. Yeah. Which is the very open world, jungly area shooter, you know, like, like Far Cry. Like <laughs> yeah. Well, the jungle, the jungle is. It doesn't necessarily mean that the jungle means that that what that was the, what the engine was no. made for. No, it means that they made it with terrain tools that were great to create natural environments. Yeah. 
you know, not necessarily very like 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 urban ones, but yeah, yeah. very very good natural, very good terrain. Uh, they have very like they have a specific vegetation tools, you know, uh, like the generation of vegetation in 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 Far Cry is excellent, you know, which like ties back to like the Cry Engine and and that those tools were created for like that specific game, right? But Crisis is not necessarily like a multiplayer game. When the engine was built, the foundation was not necessarily what they were looking for. And so that you have to adapt an engine for multiplayer and other tools, which were Far Cry 5 has the Far Cry arcade that you could make your own maps and everything. So they had like they expanded a lot, but the the background of the engine and the tools of the engine might not necessarily be the best, you know. So again, remember the right tool for the right task helps with your scoping, you know. Uh, with uh, that kind of ties to like the next uh, the next point that I would like. So we have matching the market, choosing the right tools. Then you let's say you start development. You know you have like an idea. You start development, and again everybody's very passionate about working in video games. You know, so what ends up a lot of things that end up happening like you need to keep scope under control while in development so you end up with boom feature creep yeah <laughs> i'm pretty sure you've dealt with this one as well. yes yeah now for sure like um sometimes you have your 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 gdd your game design document and you have a lot of systems or features that you want to implement right and it's very hard to let a lot of that go, mm -hmm. right? Uh, sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes you don't have the time to deal with it, right? And the more features you have, the harder it is to make all of them work and then work together. Yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. So, yeah, no, for sure. Feature creep is like... <laughs> so feature creep... That. So feature seen. creep, feature creep is a term in the game industry. You probably heard it before, and uh, we use it in the game industry to say like, sometimes there's a problem to solve, or uh, we need a certain mechanic, anything, you know, or you need a mission, you need a level, you need a thousand things, and uh, and then when you think about it, like, okay, so how do you solve a problem? Well, a lot of times it starts with brainstorming, right? Which brainstorming meetings are essential, very important, very fun, yeah. uh, very enlightening. But they yeah. tend to, uh, sometimes they tend to devolve into like, let's add this feature to solve this problem, this feature to solve this problem, this feature to solve this yeah. problem. Yeah. And, uh, and you end up with something called feature creep. And you end up with like, you're trying to solve one problem and that problem added three features to the game. So now your scope is ballooning exponentially, yeah. you know, because every feature brings more problems. So this is an exponential expansion. So feature creep is like so many times you're in a meeting and you're just passionate. Game developers are very, very passionate people and they want to make the best game possible. You have no idea how many times like all game developers, every single one of them just wants to go in and be like, I want to make the best game possible ever. You know, like I just want to like make the best game ever. Yeah. They all sit down, look at their computers and it's like, how can I make this fun? That's literally our job. But literally. because of this, sometimes you wear like little squeak, like little trembling squirrels coming up with ideas on how to solve things. And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, 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 and and sometimes you 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 think of systems that are like amazing. Yes, right. They can be amazing, but you already have like tens of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like one of my favorite uh, game developers, game director, and game designer is Fumito Ueda. For people that don't know, he made Eco, Shadow of the Colossus, The Last Guardian. Yeah. Uh, he tends to design by removing, not by adding. His problem solving is by removing the 
removing features other than adding features. So he ends up with very focused, very minimalist design, which allows him yeah. to do really special things. Really, really special things. So to put it on a per on a on a to put it into like uh, how can I say in like in an experience that I actually had to go through myself. Metro Exodus, uh, for people that played it, has two open worlds, uh, open levels, we call them. The, uh, uh, but originally, it was meant to have more. Yeah. Originally, so Metro Exodus, you have a small crew and a small train, and uh, and there's it's not open world, it's kind of linear, but there's open maps with side quests, but is kind of if you see everything tends to be small and the reason is because originally it was meant to be like way more open the train was meant to be huge and you're meant to have hundreds of people's hundreds of npcs in there and then not just that if you were meant to have companions ai companions at all times that you could direct like it was enormous it was huge yeah. You know? Sounds like it. Sounds like it. But talking with uh, with with the team that was there from the old days in in uh, the Stalker series, in the original Stalker, they were saying, "Well, we've made Metro, we've made Stalker, we know have experience with both." The designer man, like like you know, like the math should go. We can put it together and make something like that. No, you cannot. But that was like the feature creep coming in. And there was a point that the game was about to be canceled and we needed to scope back and just be like, what can we remove? And how can we get this game out of the market, like out in the market, like as a good product? So the last open world was completely scrapped for a more linear horror, a little bit horror-ish level. The train was scoped out almost completely to for like a tight crew, you know, and just expanding it a little bit. The amount of NPCs ended up in uh, not even a tenth. You know, it was like it's less than 10 people, the whole crew, you know. But because of this scope back, creativity also flows and uh, and you get a metro exodus i think my personal opinion is that it's like a really good game but part of it being a good game is because we had to go through this struggle of feature yeah. you know we have yeah, to yeah. like go uh, a lot of our like a lot of games tend to over design because we're so excited like game designers tend to be very excited about like complexity you know it's like all oh, the layers on system on top of system on top of system you know and then they end up with like over complicating things Uh, into like, oh, you you can uh, equip this weapon and this weapon, you can put jewels in it and then the jewel can have these attributes changed and you have like, you know, and it snowballs into yeah. like this overly complicated system, you know, and this happens a lot. A lot, in, in, especially in Japanese RPG, sometimes it just goes like, I don't know why. There are so many systems <laughs> on top of this. Yeah. Oh my God. No, no, but like it, it's like uh, as they say right like uh limits improve your creativity right like limits about limits and in a way limits kind of help video games be where they are right because if you mm -hmm. have a game with a million systems how many syst how many of them are actually gonna gonna be interesting how many of them are you mm -hmm. actually gonna use right <sighs> Uh, are you aware of, um, have you ever played uh, Final Fantasy Tactics, the original one? I have. Yeah, 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 I have. So, did you know that your Zodiac sign is one of the most important things in that game? Yes, I remember they asked you for that at the very beginning. They asked for your birthday, and they yes, but I didn't. I didn't really know. That. There is a full relationship system based on your zodiac sign. 
And your enemy zodiac sign, if they're like of a certain type, like, you know, if they're like opposite in the wheel or next to you on the wheel or stuff like that, your attacks change. And not just that, oh, wow. your party members, the success rate of spells and the amount of, for example, you want to heal them, the amount you heal is dependent on their zodiac sign. Wow. I didn't know that. It's hidden in a tutorial menu that explains and has the wheels that explains it to you. Now tell me why <laughs> like, I perspective. I yeah. love uh, I love Matsuno. I love the director of, of that director of Final Fantasy Vagrant Story and the original director of Final, Tw Final Fantasy 12. I love him. I, I think he's the best storyteller that Square has ever had. That that's not my problem. My problem is that he loves systems. He adores systems. Systems, he, yeah. He he adores system. Explain to me, Mauricio, why <laughs> that system exists. If you remove that system and just make it more straightforward, the game is pretty much the same. <laughs> it's pretty much the same. Now yes. you're just struggling. Well, like, why are my attacks don't work? And then it happens that your character is yeah. Capricorn, Capricorn, and your mage. Like, like your mage is a cancer. Oops, your zodiac signs don't match. Whoop did oh. he do? <laughs> oh, everyone, everyone who believes in astrology. <laughs> no, I need to. Listen, if that was yeah, the focus. Yeah. No, that's... It would be an interesting idea. Is it like, oh, okay, right. like if, if like. The job system, for example, the job system in Final Fantasy XII is based also on, on astrology, right? Yeah, but it's yeah, not. No, but it's straightforward, you know? You have a wheel with each kind exactly. of job representing something, and that's it. That's it, you know? You don't have like, hey, guess what? Your character your character is Sagittarius. Hmm. <laughs> you cannot heal a Tauros, Tauros man. It's like, like if this yeah. was Knights of the Zodiac, you know, or something like that. Like, <laughs> it blows my mind, you know? Like yeah, how much, and the thing is that this system has to still be balanced by designers, you know, this yes. and, and scripted and programmed, and there is a scope in this. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work for something that is kind of hidden, right? Like hidden all the way down into your tutorial. And it's and it's an amazing game. I love Final Fantasy Tactics. Let's get this straight. I adore that game, Mauricio. I have it's no idea. Amazing. I love that game. I love the game. I love the like, uh, like the mods for it. The competitive mod of that game is incredible. There is a mod like I guess we'll talk about this more in detail later. But it's I I love that game. I love that game. I adore it. It is such a but, good game. Such. But every game. time I play it, my 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 Ramsa, my character, I just make him first of January's birthday, and I just go to the shop and man, like and get three soldiers that have the specific zodiac signs that match with mine and that's it so that i can forget that system so that yeah. i can forget that that system exists so if i want to forget that that system exists i don't know in my opinion i don't i'm not a big fan of it you know no of course not of course not like in a way it just the, the moment people realize It's just like okay, either either we use this an, as an exploit, or I just forget about it, mm -hmm. right? And that like it doesn't doesn't speak too well about a system if when you're doing that it doesn't like that kind of feature is it's just not part of your game anymore, right? When people are, try their harder their hardest to get it out of the game, it's just not part of your game anymore. And that time could have gone into so many other things, right? Or yeah. releasing the game earlier. Now, sorry because Yuna, uh, Yuna threw my She's mouse bad. to the floor. No, 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 no. Oh, like okay. she literally grabbed the the mouse by the cable and smacked it on the floor. Like Argh! this is mine. Dude. So, so if you see, <laughs> if you think about it, like okay, so now we have three problems that happens often in the game industry that are like, you know. They contribute heavy to to overscoping. Yes, probably probably the, like they are the the big things that are overscoping, right? 
And the last point I want to make for overscoping is probably the one that you see great directors strive and not so much great leadership suffer. And that is the glorious staff. So staffing yes. your team, having the right people for the right task and understanding which tasks take priority and which stage of game development is such a rare skill. I'm not going to pretend I have it, but this is where like the great producers go in. Yeah. You know, this is like the great game producers go in and it's like they know exactly what type of person at what type of time at what moment needs to be there and do a certain task yeah because if you have a game let's say you have a game and you have like 10 writers you know but you have one programmer you know what game are you making what game are you making you know oh well yeah, yeah. a visual novel let's say you know you have a bunch of writers you know you have a uh, let's say you have a concept artists, a writer, like writers, and one or two programmers. Well, yes, your game is going to be like, let's say, a visual novel, you know, or like a story-driven game, right? So, so if you grab that staff and try to make a first-person shooter, it's not going to work. You see, Juna agrees with me. Juna is agreeing with you. Juna is like, uh, you're right. Yep. <laughs> so Juna's but, my dog for whoever's listening. So... <laughs> People might think this is obvious. Yeah. That these things are obvious. No, they're not. They're not. They're certainly but, they're not. But the reality is that they're not. <laughs> no. They're no, not. they're not. They're not. They're not. The staffing of the team sometimes is very fluid. You know, people come, people go. You know, but it's very important to accommodate your project from the very beginning for your team. Or and if if you're starting a studio, let's say, accommodate your team for the project you were funded for. No, also, also, yeah, exactly. And also like the amount of people, right? Because if oh. you want to make a triple A game, you need all sorts of designers, right? You can't just get pure level designers to make an entire game, right? And have 50, 50 game designers, right? It's, it also ties to the to the right to the right people for the right task, right? And also the amount of people, right? Because yeah. overscoping tends to tends to have a very small team working on very large projects or very large systems or whatever and they're just they're just not enough to pull it off. Not enough. It's not just it's not it's, it's or it, it, they could be enough if they were on the right task, but you know there is like a bunch of people that yeah. like they they change gears into a project or like into the next project, they were making a single yeah. player game and then they go to a multiplayer game and then they don't know how to staff the team, you know? So they're looking for programmers, they're looking, but then they're yeah. like, hey, we, have, we haven't found a network program yet. And it's like, well, yeah. it's pretty important, you know? And, and you would, you have no idea how common that is. Yeah, a no, for sure. And right now we're only talking about design issues when it comes to overscoping. Right, because for example, our like... our direction can also get huge, huge, right? And when you don't have the amount of people and the people who, who actually knows how to pull it off, it just also becomes like too much, right? Every single department ha can have like their their overscoping, and this is like uh, when it comes to game planning, what yeah. we're talking about mainly. So overscoping is just. <laughs> It's a it's a <laughs> crippling disease. It's a crippling disease yeah. in the game industry. It is true. It is true. Uh, and the, so, yeah. why this episode? Uh, so, um, so the first thing, the first thing is like why all this episode, this whole episode exists. You know, overscoping. So overscoping is understanding your strengths and weaknesses which sounds obvious, but um, Mauricio has experienced this, I experienced this, and we keep experiencing it. 
because people All keep over scoping. And why is this? I think the number one thing is that, so let's be honest, no game developer is forced to make games. Let's get this straight. No game no. developer joined the game industry or became a game, like a game developer because they were forced by their parents. Yeah. No, it's an industry that is driven a lot by passion. Exactly. And no, passion. no father. Let's get this straight. No father has ever looked at like <laughs> his son, daughter, you know, they have never looked at them and say, you have to be a game developer. I don't know if you're the child out there who was forced, please let us know. Please come out of the shell. <laughs> if the, if you're listening to this, this person, if you're listening to this and you're here, like, and, and, and please let us know. Like, I, I, I beg you because I, like there has never been, there is families that is like, you're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a teacher. You're yeah. going to be a thousand things. No parent has looked at their children and said, you're going to be a game developer. You're going to be a game designer, a game artist. You're going to be a programmer. You're going to be an engineer for video games. I yeah. read, you know, and you, I will not accept another one in my house, like a, a child in my house that is not a game developer. You know, like, yeah. this, uh, please, if this happened to you, please let us know because like I find it really hard to believe that this is out there, you know? Like, <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. Really, yeah. really hard no, it's it is an industry that is driven so much by passion and even people like let's also get this straight um playing the same playing a game is not the same as working on a game no. you might not be very passionate a, about uh playing some sort of games but working okay. on it is very different right you can, have, you can have you can yeah you can love you can love what you're doing Right. For example, maybe a level designer, or you, maybe that you were, you worked also as a level designer on Metro. Maybe you were loving doing all of those. I think you were guys. You guys were calling it frozen stories. I think. I think I saw a feature. That's about my it. first task. That's my first yeah. task. That, like, that I mean, we can. Th we'll talk about it later. But yeah. But like, you may <clears throat> not like a first-person shooter, but you were loving doing all yeah. the stories. But telling a story simply yeah. by like by its environment and you and i saying I, I, that i'm right <laughs> i'm right so uh <laughs> what my brother is referring referencing there is that i before i joined the game industry i didn't play first person shooters at all like very rarely you know i like two and that was like one was halo and i think uh the other one was time splitters and those were we like also the, loved call of duty modern warfare one i think yeah modern warfare call of duty for modern warfare like the original modern warfare i really liked but that's it like i didn't play first person shooters shooters at all but i loved working on them i loved it 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 and i and, and i will always yeah. love it so it's just really different right but yeah what this I, is where passion comes from it's, it's exactly is is where it's a very passionate bunch of very opinionated people that want to make yeah. the perfect game you know yeah. well but perfectionism as you'll see in this uh in the, i think we'll mention this before and after this but the whole idea of this podcast is that things look kind of not perfect yeah and uh, one of the messages is that perfectionism tends to overscope really easy and it doesn't help the game industry, like video game development at all. No, for sure. It doesn't. No game it is doesn't. truly finished ever. You have to, at some point, pull the plug and say, this is how we're releasing. Because no game is finished. The, the, we, we keep adding stuff and feature creep comes in all the time. And you keep adding stuff over and over and over again. For sure. Or you keep polishing forever. You can polish this forever forever there is always something to do in game development and that's and that's that's the truth right so if you ever are like if you are listening to this yeah just be careful because a well scoped game tends to bring a lot of more creativity a lot of more unique ideas and a lot of creative solutions 
that tend to be used in future games to come. And not just that, it just yeah. brings a better product. Uh, yeah. I think no, people I... should be less concerned in a game lasting 40 hours and uh, or 100 hours and being super huge in scope and more focus on and teams should be focusing more on delivering tight really tight experiences that are well scoped yeah f no for sure like um also if you're a student out there and you're working on your on your project uh careful with this ah! careful with over scoping right uh try actually as a student like scope it down a little bit right <laughs> scope it down you probably have uh, so many good ideas my advice to students would be focus on one thing one mechanic yeah it like can be strip, strip it to the, to the score yeah. <laughs> to the bare minimum to the bare minimum just scope it to the the one thing it can be jumping, shooting, just one thing. Just scope yeah. it. Just scope it. Uh, to you know, like just one thing. If you're a student, and if you like, like if you find yourself in an overscope project, remember that at least try to scope down your own work so you take care of yourself. You know, uh, make sure is make sure to not add more features but sometimes removing helps removing has always helped me uh, we have a counter in a CQC system uh, for example remove the counter the scope down remove things before trying to add more and see yeah. how that helps your problem I think the whole game industry needs to learn a more minimalist approach of design because the scopes of games are getting huge enormous and with scopes come money and budgets you know so i think yeah. we all the game i think if if the game industry takes an approach of minimalist design of removing scoping down i think the gamers would win and game developers would win we all win if we just slow down, scope down. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be ambitious. But the, what this means is that not every game needs to have everything on it. Yeah. Sometimes it's better to just keep it simple. <laughs> and that is the perfect way to end today's episode. Yeah. In the end, just keep it simple. You will thank yourself. Be minimalist. Remove before you add. You know, remove. If I, there is a problem, try solving it by removing instead of adding. Keep it simple. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for listening. Again, I'm Santi. I'm Mao, and this is Yuna, and I hope she was not distracting you the entire episode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's a three-month old husky. Come on. <laughs> this is the game design perspective. Like, comment, subscribe. See you guys next week. Have a good one, guys. Yeah. <laughs>